it's interesting, if you think about pre-World War II, um, the center, the philosophical center uh, in Britain was really Cambridge. Uh, but it started to shift between the wars, and after World War II, uh, it's really Oxford. So there's a real, I mean, certainly prior to World War I, it's all Cambridge. Okay, so you've got, you've got, you've got uh, G. Moore, you've got Bertrand Russell, Ludwig Wittgenstein, Frank Ramsey, and Whitehead, Alfred North Whitehead, and all the action in philosophy seems to be there from the beginning of the 20th century right up until World War I. And then after World War I, things start to change a little bit. And there's a slow shift now between the wars. Uh, and things are starting to happen in Oxford, um, largely as a result of, of people like Eyre and later Ryle. Um, but after the Second World War, the action is all in Oxford, really. There's very little happening in Cambridge. So it's, it's a quite an interesting intellectual development here. But one of the things that's happened, there's, there was, a, there was a, a gravitation towards a way of thinking about language which started at Cambridge but which really flowered in Oxford. So you had people like Wittgenstein and, and Moore talking about the way we're using language, we should focus more on this uh, in reaction to uh, the way things had been done previously. But that idea really took root in Oxford. Um, and through particularly people like J.L. Austin and then Strawson, and to some extent Grice, though Grice became a bit of a renegade in a certain way, a, a very adept practitioner of ordinary language philosophy, Oxford-style philosophy if you want to call it that, but at the same time he saw its limitations. But he was certainly part of this movement in the 50s. So there was now a big emphasis on the way that we actually use language to uh, communicate with one another, the way we use language to state philosophical problems. And you can see part of what's driving this. If our initial philosophical problems are stated in ordinary language, we, we get each other riled up with philosophical issues, just chatting to each other in our ordinary talk, how can moving to this new specialized formal language, which is cleaned up of a lot of the properties of natural language, how can you solve those problems in this language? Because the solutions that pop out, they're not even in senses of ordinary English anymore. So how can you have even claimed to have solved these problems? You can see what's driving these people. There's something very right about what was going on, but there was something very wrong in the idea that you should reject formalism completely, because it's still true that you can use formalism to make great advances. Uh, you can use uh, certainly to short circuit things and uh, clarify types of discussion. I mean, where would physics be if we had to do it in English? Hopeless. Um, so it's clear we can certainly do things by um, bringing in our own formal languages. But the idea that philosophical problems, which are just stated in ordinary language, can somehow be solved in some technical language does seem a bit odd. So there was something very right about what those guys were, were saying. There were a lot of interesting developments in the 1960s on this score as people began to think more about, well, what was right and wrong about Strawson and what was right and wrong about Russell. And the idea very naturally emerged uh, I was told it was a frequent topic of tutorial discussions at Oxford in the 1950s. Uh, maybe there's some truth to both stories. Maybe definite descriptions are actually ambiguous between a Russell-type quantificational use and a more Strawson-type referential use. Um, is that a plausible way to go? And the, the, the sort of answer that Grice gave uh, in, the, in, the, in the 50s and in the 60s was, well, why do we want to have this type of ambiguity? Can't we just somehow finesse this ambiguity by distinguishing between what the speaker says and what the speaker means but doesn't literally say? And so the idea would be you might use a description in the Strawson style way even though what you literally say is given by the Russell type semantics. So here would be an example, the sort of example that became popular th a bit later through the work of um, Keith Donnellan at UCLA. You see a man in the corner drinking something out of a glass. It's a clear, it's a martini glass with a clear liquid in. And you say, the man in the corner drinking a martini looks sad. And in fact that guy, let's suppose he is sad, suppose he does look sad. Uh, then you've said something true. Now, but what, so it seems, 
But what if it's not a martini? What if it's just water? Is it true that the man in the corner drinking the martini looks sad? Well, there is no man in the corner drinking martini. So you feel in some way something was right about your speech act and something was wrong. It was right in the sense that you drew attention to the person you wanted to say something about successfully by using the phrase, the man in the corner drinking a martini. And then you said something true about that person. But at the same time, you feel something's gone wrong because you misdescribed the guy. That is, you, you said that there was a man in the corner drinking martini. Uniquely, a man in the corner drinking martini, and then he looks sad, and there isn't. So something went very wrong. How do you resolve this? Well, one way that people thought was, so look, we'll, we'll go the referential route here. Um, you said something true. Um, so Russell was wrong. The Russell truth conditions are wrong because there isn't, there does not exist a, guy, a unique guy in the corner drinking um, a martini. The other, the alternative route was to go the way that basically that Grice was suggesting and say, well, look, there's really two things going on here. There's what you literally said, which is given by the Russell story, which is that there is a unique man in the corner drinking a uh, martini and he's sad, and that's false. However, what you meant was that guy, him. He looks sad, and that's true. So once you split, uh, it's not always true that what you mean is something you actually say, that you can mean things that you don't say. So what you said was false, but what you meant was true. So that type of story uh, was regarded as very attractive by some people because it, you, you reduce the ambiguities. And Grice, of course, took this, um, took this a long way uh, with words like and. Uh, this, so this goes back to this ordinary language um, critique again. People like Strawson had said, well, look, and seems to be ambiguous. We use it in these different ways. Sometimes you mean just when you say P and Q, you mean P's true and Q's true. But sometimes you mean, mean P is P is true, and then afterwards Q. Um, so the classic example would be Jack and Jill got married and Jill had twins versus Jill had twins and Jack and Jill got married. There's a very strong implication that the thing you mentioned first preceded the thing you mentioned second. And Grice said, well, we don't need this type of ambiguity. We can explain that uh, by saying that what you said was just given by the logical and. You just said Jack and Jill got married, Jill had twins. You stated those two things conjunctively. But what you meant, in addition, was that they got married first and then had twins, rather than if you'd put them the other way around, then you would have meant, probably, um, that they had the twins and then they got married. Um, so this general strategy of trying to reduce the number of ambiguities was one that Grice was very keen to, um, keen to uh, pursue. And with the theory of descriptions, he pursued it, as others have done. Kripke pursued it, I pursued it, in trying to say, look, in trying to motivate the idea that there's just a single semantics, the Russellian semantics for descriptions, isn't refuted by any of these examples once we have a distinction between what you say and what you mean, because sometimes you mean things that go well beyond what you say. Quine said some many, many very, very smart, sensible things during his philosophical career. The slogan to be is to be the value of a bound variable isn't one of them, in my view. Uh, it's either empty or just states something so obvious it's hardly worth stating. Quine, as I mentioned before, had a very austere view of what logic actually is. It's extensional, first-order logic. Now, if that's right, you've made a commitment already by your use of the existential quantifier and your use of the variables. You've already decided what the variables range over. The variables range over extensional objects, those things which actually exist. And, you can quantify over those, and you've al you're already committed to the existence of those objects. If you now say, well, look, I'm going to allow the variables to range over, uh, the values of you know, variables can be things, say, from Sherlock Holmes stories. Um, so surely I can say, um, there are three principal characters in the Sherlock Holmes stories. Uh, Sherlock Holmes, uh, what, Dr. Watson, and Moriarty example. Now, so 
there are th these three characters. There, uh, there is this detective, there is this doctor, there is this arch criminal. Um, they are the values of the variables when I s they can be the values of the variables when I'm talking this way. Um, but that doesn't mean that they exist in any sense that's going to satisfy somebody who thinks that when we're talking we when we're talking about existence we're not talking about what's going on in fiction but you might just say well look they do exist they're fictional characters and fictional characters do exist they don't exist in in fiction fictional characters exist in the real world right then the, there are the characters that actually exist in the fiction right and fictional characters exist here um, so it's all loaded, your, all your talk of existence and, and being, being the value of a band variable. The idea that Quine's trying to get across is that once you associate a quantifier with a variable, you're making an existence claim, and so you're saying that something exists. And that's what, once you do that, you're committed to the existence of those entities. And it makes it sound sometimes like it's a sufficient condition, and sometimes as if it's a necessary condition. Um, but really, everything is already built into what you're allowing your variables to range over and how you're construing the existential quantifier. I mean, there are different ways of actually construing the quantifier. But Quine has this very blinkered view of what logic is. Um, there's another way of, of, of thinking about what he's saying here, which is that he's making a distinction between, say, names, constant singular terms, and variables, and saying you can't, you can't read the ontology of sentences containing names because you may be using names for things that don't exist but once you use a variable you are now making explicitly um, a commitment to the existence uh, of an entity um, well that there's no evidence to think that um, names lack this particular property, apart from the fact that we do use names in many senses to say that um, it's to say things which seem true, even though the name doesn't refer. Like Santa Claus doesn't exist, seems true. Well, how can I be referring to Santa Claus then? So it looks as if being the what's associated with a uh, constant referring expression, a constant term, may not do the trick. But of course you might say, well look, um, of course Santa Claus exists, we wouldn't, we've just been talking about him. So it's, it's not as if we're getting, this talk of be, to be is to be the value of Van Bergen, it doesn't seem to get us anywhere. Um, it just, it's either stating this trivial fact that, well, we have the existential quantifier, and when you hook up a variable with the existential quantifier, you're saying something exists. Well, that's hardly news. Um, or it's just saying something which just completely begs the question. So it's, it seems to me that's not one of Quine's great contributions, of which there have been many. That's not one of them. My defense of Russell is based on thinking about the semantics of uh, ordinary language, natural language. And it seems to me it, it, Russell's theory makes a great contribution to our understanding of the way certain types of expressions actually do work in the language, or how we use expressions in the language, if you prefer. Um, Russell was not, as I said earlier, Russell wasn't trying to inaugurate this new field, the philosophy of language, or anything like that. Um, he was motivated by issues in logic and, to some extent, ontology. Um, but it became very clear over time that this could be taken to be a theory which could be embedded in a more general theory about the way natural language actually works, the theory of quantification. That is that phrases of the form the so-and-so were very much like phrases of the form every so-and-so or some so-and-so or no so-and-so. That is, they're quantified phrases. And what was lacking at the time that Russell was writing was in part a serious syntax of natural language, a grammatical theory of natural language of the sort that Noam Chomsky began providing really in the, in, the, in the 50s and been developing ever since. So some idea of, of the structure of natural language. And then once you've had such a theory, a, a way of actually representing the um, contributions being made semantically by certain types of expression in the language. You had this very um, 
very nice in some ways formalism of first order logic. It's very useful for certain types of enterprises. But it doesn't capture something very important um, about natural language that when we say, for instance, um, all men are mortal, the way you would say this in language, saying for, for every x, if x is a man, then x is mortal. The, the, the man bit is not tied up to the all bit. You're saying for all x, right, the following is true. If x is a man, then x is mortal. And you somehow think, well, wait a minute, it's not... Or if you do it with some men are mortal, it's even better, because if you say um, there exists some x such that x is a man, x is mortal, right? There exists some x such that x is a man and x is mortal. That it has the same meaning as um, there exists some x such that x is immortal and x is a man. And you feel that somehow when you say some man is mortal, you're talking about some men. You want the men and the some bits, as in all men are mortal. So what was knacking in part was a notation for capturing this, but not just a notation, a semantics which enabled you to actually do this in a sort of fluid way uh, and to be incorporated with a, 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 into a, a more general semantics of natural language that fitted with the syntax, with the grammatical theory of natural language. And that didn't really start to come about until the 60s. And so the, 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 the natural way of embedding Russell's theory of descriptions into a theory of meaning for natural language simply wasn't available at the time Russell was writing about this. Um, to the extent that Russell would have approved of the project that we now call the semantics of natural language, I suppose he would have thought, yeah, this is great. This is a great way of doing it. It simplifies things. Um, it makes things, um, makes things um, much more straightforward. So it seemed to me this was a, it was a great contribution. Once you'd converted it, translated it, transposed it, however you want to think of this, Russell's theory, and got it into the right sort of notation in the right sort of format, embedded into the right sort of theory for which we had the right sort of syntactic theory, it seemed this is a great contribution to our understanding of the way natural language worked. So I was sufficiently intrigued by the theory of descriptions and its applications. I was actually interested in an application at the time when I was doing my uh, graduate work at Stanford. And I started to think about events under different descriptions and I realized I needed a discussion of descriptions to make this work. And I got this footnote became an appendix and then it became a whole chapter and it, it took over and the event stuff just got left behind and I ended up with a dissertation on descriptions, on the, 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 the power of Russell's theory of descriptions and the extent to which the criticisms of that theory were unfounded. So that's why I wrote my dissertation, that's the book Descriptions, it was, it's just a sort of tidied up version of the dissertation. So that was, that was how I was thinking about things in the, 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 the late 80s. I suppose the book actually came out in 1990, but it was all, it was, stuff was written in the late 80s. The, in some ways, I mean, I think one of the things I wrote in the preface of Descriptions, I'm sure it's something like this, is that there's nothing original here. What's, what I'm, all I'm trying to do is just do this sort of transposition and maneuver everything around in such a way that you can see why this is a good theory and does a great deal more than, than people think. Now, I suppose there's some, you know, creative process goes in actually doing this transformation, but I, I meant that sincerely. There's, there are no original ideas there, per se. There's maybe, you know, a halfway original implementation of pre-existing ideas which seemed to me were underappreciated but not because people weren't very appreciative but because the machinery, the technology, the environment, the culture for understanding the force of the theory, the power of the theory simply weren't around and have been evolving slowly since the 1960s really. So um, it was that the potential of the theory to fit into a theory of natural language semantics that intrigued me. Um, but I was also intrigued by two other things. One is that this was the one theory that Russell never gave up his entire life. In fact, when he was 85 years old, he responded to Strawson in print. In 1957, he wrote this polemical pile driver of a response to Strawson at 85 years old, saying he stood by everything that he said, you know, about descriptions before. And it's the, it's the only thing we know of that Russell sort of, you know, didn't change his mind on within about six months. The theory of descriptions, which he, you know, to his dying day, um, this was the theory he thought was his major, his major contribution to philosophy. And I was tempted to agree because the, the types of ambiguities and things that the, the theory was able to expose 
have really prevented all sorts of philosophical mistakes, prevented all sorts of philosophical muddles from arising. Well, not enough, unfortunately. But there are certain types of, of confusions which were just so endemic in the 50s and 60s, which, and even to the, in the 70s and 70s, you couldn't really get into that confused state anymore because we're all sensitive to this distinction between, say, names and descriptions, and these properties that descriptions have of having scope with respect to modal operators and attitude verbs and all sorts of non-extensional operators. So it has a great therapeutic effect in philosophy. So I was, I was very intrigued by the therapeutic effect of this, as I was very intrigued by the therapeutic effect of Grice's distinction between what you say and what you mean. It seems to clear up a lot of things. It seems to make, make life a lot easier once you make this distinction. There's certain distinctions that get made in philosophy, and once they're made and they, they gel, they just make life so much easier, and they stop you wasting years of your life down blind alleys. And the theory of description seems to me like a classic example of this. 2005, it was the, uh, a century after the um, On Denoting was first published, and I edited this volume of Mind uh, to celebrate the centenary of this, with a lot of new articles on descriptions, including papers by Kripke and Kaplan and others. Um, and the question naturally arises, why are people still discussing this theory a hundred years later? This is unusual, isn't it? Well, of course, in analytic philosophy, we don't have many theories that are a hundred years old yet. Um, this is one of the few that we do actually have. But it is striking that it's still being discussed by, you know, eminent members of the field and younger people in the field. I mean, when I picked the people to write uh, papers for that issue of mine, I thought, I really want to span here. So I got people who'd retired, like Dick Cartwright. I got people who were towards the tail end of their philosophical career, shall we say, like Kaplan and Kripke. Um, I also got people who just started out, like one was, it was his first year assistant professor, um, Ray Buchanan. And then um, an an another one, uh, Lasse Jonsson from the University of Iceland, who really was just, just starting out. So I wanted people at both ends of the spectrum career-wise, but also people who were real advocates of the theory and people who were real opponents to get a complete span. Um, and of course, what unified all these papers for that volume was the incredible depth of understanding all these people had, even the younger people who were just starting out, of why this theory was so important, even if they hated it why this theory has been so important in the history of analytic philosophy. And the reason I think it's, it's really important, and, and surely this is part of the reason that Russell stuck with it, is that once you actually get the theory in your head, you start to see all sorts of statements that people are making in philosophy through the lens of this distinction we need to make between referring to some object and simply describing an object in some unique way, that it, in some way that it can be uniquely picked out. And that the properties you're using to pick it out with a description aren't necessarily the ones that you're going to focus on when you're thinking about the object later. So you want this capacity to actually home in on an object without having some expression which is simply a tag or a name for that object. So here's the way I like to think of it. What do you do if you haven't got a name for something and you want to talk about it? Well, you can point at it and you can say that thing over there, because not everything has a name. And you can, so you can use a demonstrative like this or that. That enables you to talk about something if it's in the environment that you don't have a name for. Suppose you want to talk about something that's not in the environment. You can do that too if you have a name for it. So that's a way of talking about things when they're not around, you can use a name. Now, problem case. What do you do if you want to talk about something, you don't have a name for it, and it's not around to be pointed at? How do you start talking about that thing? And the answer is that you effect some sort of compromise. What you do is you come up with some property that that object and no other object has. And that's all a definite description is. It's a solution to a problem. And that's the way I like to think of the, the power of, the, of definite descriptions. They're a solution to a type of problem. How to talk about things that you aren't around you to be pointed at or referred to with demonstratives and that you don't have a name for. The descriptions are a solution to that problem. So we need a theory which explains how it is that we manage to pull this off. And the theory of descriptions gives an extremely compelling explanation of how we're able to do that. 
Now it's true that we do have these referential uses of descriptions and maybe they're even the, the dominant uses of descriptions and to that extent statistically there are going to be lots of cases where referential theories apply but the Russell theory gives us this amazing power to talk about things which aren't around us that we don't have names for and Russell talks, makes this epistemological distinction between knowledge by acquaintance and knowledge by description. That is, you can have knowledge of, if you're actually aware of the thing, if you see it, you can have knowledge of it. But he talks about this, maybe it's not quite the right locution, but he talks about knowledge by description. That is, it's the ability to be able to think of and conceive of some object in the absence of that object itself and in the absence of some name of that object. That aspect of the use of descriptions seems to be captured by Russell's theory and by no other. And that seems to me the reason that whether we bill it to ourselves this way or not, that's the reason we are still compelled to think about descriptions and to think about the power of Russell's theory. So even if it turns out that, that as an account of the way descriptions work in natural language, there are theories which better handle most ordinary cases of the use of descriptions, it's still the fact that we have to be able to handle these attributive type uses um, is going to need explaining. And Russell's theory seems to be the only the only show in town when it comes to that. Um, then there are all sorts of technical reasons why it's uh, still, um, still, been, uh, still been studied. It explains various types of ambiguities which people have had great trouble explaining any other way, uh, these scope ambiguities. And Kripke argued very compellingly in the late 70s that you know, these scope amb ambiguities cannot be replaced by any binary distinction between attributive and referential or de re and de dicto. Um, those are all binary distinctions. The scope ambiguities that Russell's theory enables you to display are as, as large as you like, depending on how many operators you've got around. And that's a great um, power of the theory. That aspect of the, I mean, Zoltan Zabo at, at Yale has written, wrote a very nice paper, for, in fact, for this issue of mind on this topic, saying that for him that was the real the real crux of the theory, the important thing. It enabled you to make these scope, to have sc scope assignments and to discuss these in ways that were um, philosophically fruitful and fruitful for thinking about the way we use natural language. Zabo thinks this, was, this is really the key ingredient to the theory. Um, I mean, that, it's certainly, I, I, th I, I sympathize with the idea that it's, it's a major reason for hanging on to the theory. I don't think it's what was driving Russell, though once he saw that it could do this, boy, did he jump on this and milk it for all it was worth. Um, so again, it's one, of, it's one of these theories which has so many sort of spin-off benefits in, in epistemology to some extent, in psychology, the difference between an object-dependent thought and an object-independent thought, in semantics, um, and in logic. So it's very unusual to find a theory which has really driven people to investigate issues in logic, the philosophy of language, um, epistemology, and psychology, uh, and the philosophy of mind in, in quite this way. It's very unusual. And that surely is part of the lure of the theory, why we find it very difficult, some of us find it very difficult to stop talking about it. I've tried. I've sworn off saying I'm never going to write anything else about definite descriptions. I've tried, but about every five or six years, it just wells up and comes out again, and I feel I've got to say something more about it. I'm trying to give it up. I'm trying very hard, but it's not going very well.